wonderful discussion. Thanks for joining us. And we'll get started in just a little bit. Maybe one to two minutes and we'll go ahead and get started. So wait for folks to filter in. Thank you. If you're just joining us, welcome. Thank you so much. We're just giving it a minute or so as folks um, filter into our discussion room and we'll get started soon. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Protect Our Coast panel discussion. I'm delighted to welcome you all. We have a really fantastic event lined up for today. Uh, my name is Hunter Miller. I'm the senior field representative for Oceana here in Florida. Um, my family and I call Florida, Florida's Gulf Coast home. Um, and this area is the traditional homelands and territories of the Seminole, as well as uh, other historical groups, including uh, the Calusa and Tokobaga. And today, the state of Florida is home to the Seminole, the Miccosukee, the Muscogee, and Choctaw, and to individuals of many other Native groups, both recognized and unrecognized by the federal government of the United States of America. And I just wanted to recognize that these Native nations and individuals uh, have protected and stewarded Florida's land, water, and oceans for centuries. And to this day, they still are at the forefront of that work, uh, most work recently working to stop Big Oil's attempt to drill in Florida's Everglades in addition to off our coastlines. So I wanted to recognize these people and fully support their indigenous sovereignty and right to clean air, land, and water. So thank you for making space for that. Again, I'm so excited to be joined by U.S. Representative Kathy Castor, our coalition partners uh, and allies from acro across Florida and uh, the Gulf South. This is a critical time uh, in the fight to protect our coast and combat efforts to expand uh, dirty offshore drilling. Uh, if we have time at the end of this program, um, we will take a few questions and we just ask that you utilize the Q&A feature and we will do our best to get to those questions. So now I'm going to pass it over to our co-moderator, moderator, uh, Kelsey Lamp from Environment America to introduce Representative Castor. Kelsey. Yeah, thanks so much, Hunter. My name is Kelsey Lamp and I direct ocean campaigns with Environment Florida and Environment America. And I am so glad to see you all here today to talk about why it's so important that we protect our coast from offshore drilling. From the Everglades to the beaches of Pensacola, we're lucky to have some of our country's most spectacular natural spaces at our fingertips and in our backyards. And that's why for generations, Floridians have worked to tirelessly protect our beaches, our ocean wildlife, and our coastal communities from the threat of offshore drilling. And with support of our congressional leaders like Representative Castor, we've been able to keep drilling rigs far from our coasts from passing moratoriums on drilling in federal waters off Florida's beaches to overwhelmingly voting to prohibit oil drilling in state waters, the people of Florida have made it clear that we want to protect our coast. But 12 years ago, we got a vivid illustration of the fact that oil doesn't respect state boundaries. When the BP Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded, it sent more than 160 million gallons of oil gushing into the Gulf of Mexico covering our ocean life in oil and sending tar, ball, tar balls rolling up on Florida's beaches. The BP spill started in the center of the Gulf, far from our coast, but its impact was felt by our wildlife and our coastal communities. Today, you'll hear from key voices about what we can do to keep our coastlines, our wildlife, and our communities safe from the threats posed by oil spills, from the threats and also from the threats posed by the oil and gas that makes it to shore. So that's why I am glad to be a part of this event and to introduce Representative Kathy Castor, who chairs the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis and who has introduced bills to permanently protect Florida's federal waters from offshore drilling. 
So now I'll turn it over to Representative Castor to talk about her ongoing work to protect our coast. Well, thank you, Kelsey. Thanks, Hunter. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm coming to you from my office uh, here at home in Tampa uh, and uh, fresh from a, a visit to, to the beach over this, this spectacular weekend we had. And it was, uh, it was crowded. People were out enjoying our beautiful Gulf beaches on this side of the state. And so this, this conversation is, is very timely about how we are going to work together to, to protect what makes Florida special, to protect our coastline, uh, and also to protect the pocketbooks of Floridians uh, at this time of high gas prices and high electric bills. Uh, but, but starting out, we, we know here in the Sunshine State that our beautiful beaches, the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic side, all of our waterways are central to our way of life. Um, it's, it's the cornerstone of our economy, whether that's tourism or fishing. We know firsthand uh, that offshore oil drilling is dirty, it's risky, it's costly, uh, but at the same time, people are looking for answers to high energy prices. So I'm, I'm heartened that we have advocates here with us today that are gonna talk about those solutions going forward. But I think we, we start off uh, pretty united that opening up new areas off the coast of Florida uh, to oil and gas drilling would be it really would not provide no it would would not provide relief to consumers. You're going to hear a lot of folks out there saying uh, it's time to to open up areas that have been closed off before to to drilling. But we know very well here how risky that is. Uh, most of us live through the BP Deepwater Horizon blowout where the drilling didn't even happen close to our uh, Gulf beaches, uh, but we were still hit economically. And I'll, I will never forget, uh, you know, hugging, looking into the eyes of small business owners uh, along the Pinellas beaches uh, who were just devastated coming out of the Great Recession. And then that was another hit to it. We know that drilling is a dirty business too. It muds, metals, uh, toxic mercury in a place where hurricanes frequent. It's, it's just a calamity waiting to happen. Now you add in the rising costs of the climate crisis as well. Uh, what we're seeing with higher temperatures brings higher electric bills. Unfortunately, what's happening to the water table, uh, higher flood insurance rates, our neighbors are experiencing higher property insurance rates, higher cost of government to repair and upgrade water, uh, water lines, wastewater facilities. Uh, so there is a climate element that a lot of folks who say, let's go drill, they don't ever really factor those costs into the equation, but they're real. And then globally speaking, uh, after the invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin, I think everyone is awake to the fact that we don't want these petro despots or oil cartels controlling our lives anymore. They know we've got to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels that's uh, choking our economy, our security, really our whole society. And I'm so proud to watch the uh, our allies in the EU say that in response, they're going to stay off the Russian oil, wean themselves off and ramp up uh, what they're doing on clean energy and energy efficiency. So I wanna share a little story with you as well. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had the CEOs from all of the big oil and gas companies in front of my committee. And it was, it was, very interesting because a lot of my GOP colleagues, of course, were on the mantra of open up new lands, build new pipelines, double down on fossil fuels. And those CEOs said, uh, no, they've got it pretty good right now. They, they do not intend to increase supply. Uh, and in fact, they are sitting on thousands of unused leases. 
so there's there's a great fallacy in what a lot of my colleagues are saying that we need to push them to ramp up uh, supply. They they could do that if they want to, but they don't want to because they are making record profits right now, keeping supply tight, and they're afraid that we're they're going to get into another pinch where, as you saw during the pandemic, the demand for oil and gas went down, and they know they don't want to be ramping up and depending on stranded assets. So that's why we passed a, a bill a couple of weeks ago to get at the price gouging of these uh, big oil companies and CEOs as they pad their bottom line, as they do stock buybacks. I asked them, why don't you do the patriotic thing at a time of, of war and simply pass on some savings to consumers? Uh, they're not gonna do that. So we're gonna look at other ways like a windfall profits tax on them. So what's coming up now is the Interior Department is about to propose a draft five-year leasing plan for offshore waters. I'm hoping, and here's one of our action items today, I believe we've got to encourage the administration to focus on lower cost, clean energy now, not new oil and gas leases that, that the big oil companies have said they're not going to use anyway. Um, according to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, oil and gas companies are sitting on 2,000 of those offshore leases covering near, nearly 11 million acres on federal waters. Uh, so a lack of leases is not a problem. So we've got, I'm going to ask you all to weigh in with the Interior and others through the advocates here today to encourage them to go farther, faster on offshore wind, other uh, clean energy initiatives. And remember, the fossil fuel companies, they are exporting a large amount of oil and gas that's uh, generated here in America. We, we've got to be smarter, and we've got to wean ourselves off of volatile fossil fuels and ramp up clean energy, like lower cost solar and wind and energy efficiency and electric cars and better transit. And we can do this. Uh, look at the Interior Department's successful offshore wind sail uh, in New York, they raised more than $4 billion and we're gonna live through a remarkable transition. But it means rapidly increasing domestic carbon-free energy generation and energy efficiency measures and reducing, not expanding public lands and waters exposed to the risk of oil and gas drilling. The last thing we need is a massive a new lease sale that locks in future generations to decades more dependence on volatile fuels that hold us hostage to these global pr price shocks. Um, so here's another fun fact for everybody. Did you know that just a couple of weeks ago, the entire state of California was powered almost 100% by renewable energy? That's a lot of solar. Uh, we're not anywhere near that here in the Sunshine State, but we should be going all in right now to lower costs for families and businesses through these lower cost renewables. Last November, the House of Representatives passed a package of tax credits that could help consumers right away reduce the annual utility bills by $500. American automakers are moving to all electric. Those tax credits would make those EVs more affordable now plus the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, all, has already passed and you're going to see electric vehicle charging all across America, particularly here in the Sunshine State. Funds for electric school buses and expanded tr transit. Plus right now, the House and Senate have passed an important bill you may not have heard about. It's called America Competes. It's vitally important for clean energy development because it will improve our supply chains, uh, solar, domestic, manufacturing, and a lot of good uh, policies related to the oceans as well. So it's clear we've got to act now. We can't double down on the, on, on the dirty solutions of the past. It, it, they're costly. They're, they threaten our way of life here in Florida. Uh, I'm going to keep working as well on my Florida Coastal Protection Act that will permanently ban 
offshore drilling off of the coast of Florida. We passed it. It was included in the Build Back Better Act. We passed it in the House last year. It got stuck on Mitch McConnell's desk. But I'm more hopeful than ever that we will be able to unleash America's clean energy future and protect our beautiful natural resources uh, like Florida's beaches and everything that makes Florida special. You all give me confidence that we're gonna get there. Uh, so I wanna thank you all for coming together this afternoon and let's talk about some of these solutions on the table. Thanks again. Wow, thank you so much, Representative Castor and really, appreciate your remarks and your just willingness to be here and have this conversation. What you decide, described as a difficult time for a lot of folks, but it's so important that we continue to talk about this. Um, and I really also appreciated your call to action for folks to get involved um, with the uh, next five-year plan. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing is engaging our members, engaging the public and elected leaders to really be involved in that process and and call for renewable energy and call for no new leasing and, um, and ensure that we're not locking ourselves into decades and decades of, of more dirty and, and dangerous offshore drilling. So I really appreciate that very much. Um, and I'm, I'm also really delighted to, um, we have a really great panel that's going, each panel has a, a different, panelist has a different background, uh, a different perspective of, of why this is so important. And so I'm really excited to introduce our next panelist um, for today's, uh, today's panel discussion. Uh, Dr. Sarah Giltz, who's Oceana's marine scientist for our offshore drilling campaign. Uh, she's a marine ecologist by training with a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Tulane University, where she studied the effects of the deep water horizon oil spill and ocean acidification on blue crabs and zooplankton in the Gulf of Mexico. She now lives in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I'm happy to introduce her now, Sarah. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Giltz. I'm a marine scientist with the Ocean Conservation Organization Oceana, and I'm based in New Orleans. I appreciate the opportunity to, today to be part of this event with so many uh, great uh, speakers we have here. And I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the dangers of offshore drilling and oil spills for coastal communities and marine wildlife. Offshore drilling causes oil spills and fuels the climate crisis. And these are just some of the reasons why we must protect our coast from new offshore drilling. First, I'm going to look back at the devastating BP Deepwater Horizon disaster. We all recall the horror of seeing oil spew into the Gulf of Mexico for months and washing, watching oil wash up on the beaches and cover birds and fish. This oil disaster caused catastrophic impacts to the environment and killed animals across the Gulf of Mexico. 1,300 miles of shoreline were oiled from Texas to Florida. And in addition to the huge number of dead animals you see on this slide, the fish, the turtles, the birds, oil hit some species particularly hard. For bottlenose dolphins, oil caused liver damage, tooth loss, and lung problems. For five years, more than 75% of dolphin pregnancies failed in the oiled area. And the rice's whale, which is unique to, to the Gulf of Mexico, and their population decreased about 20% following the disaster. And these are among the most endangered whales in the entire world, and the oil industry activities remain a primary threat to their precarious survival. And there were also huge economic impacts from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. These were devastating and widespread. Fishing was shut down, many people were scared to eat Gulf seafood, and the seafood industry lost nearly a billion dollars. Over 10 million user days of beach fishing and boating activity were lost, which cost the recreation industry over $500 million. And yet today, offshore drilling remains dirty and dangerous. And it's not just these huge oil disasters that we have to worry about. The industry's safety record is unacceptable. There are too many spills and too many worker injuries each year. Between 2007 and 2018, there were more than 7,000 oil spills, which comes out to about two every single day as well as 115 fires and explosions each year. And this continues to this day. 
but offshore drilling also brings infrastructure to the coast. Any traditional pipeline or refinery brings risks of accidents and spills. And you can see from this map here that the infrastructure footprint of the oil industry in the Gulf of Mexico is massive. There are about 2,000 offshore platforms and 26,000 miles of pipeline, and that's more than enough to circle the earth. In addition to oil spills and infrastructure, offshore drilling also fuels the climate crisis through contributing massive amounts of greenhouse gas pollution. Protecting our coasts from offshore drilling must be part of our efforts to prevent the worst impacts of climate change. Permanently protecting all federal waters from offshore drilling can prevent more than 19 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. That's equivalent to taking every car off the road for 15 years. And all those greenhouse gas emissions translate into climate change caused damages that cost our communities money. That's increased flooding, worsening human health, loss of ecosystem services like water filtration. All of those things are made worse through climate change. So protecting our coast from new oil development can prevent over $720 billion in damages to people, property, and the environment. This would be like losing the entire economy of a major city like Washington, DC, Boston, or Atlanta for a year. So offshore drilling threatens coastal communities with oil spills and pollution and threatens all of us through climate change. We need to transition now to clean renewable energy sources, and we have the technology to make that possible. The ocean can be part of the solution to our energy needs through renewable energy sources like offshore wind, which has the potential to generate more electricity than our nation currently demands. We must choose clean energy to protect our coasts and our communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, really appreciate that. Um, okay, on to our next panelist, um, Getulio Gonzalez Mulatieri. Um, is with us today. Getulio is a community organizer with Cheese Buff Florida. Um, he is a United States Air Force veteran, a community organizer, and a civic-minded advocate. He's devoted to the ideal of democracy and is passionate in his pursuit of justice and equity for frontline communities. Recently, Getulio and I gathered together uh, for Hands Across the Sand uh, with Tampa Bay residents to call for President Biden to protect our coast and offer no new leasing, offshore drilling leases uh, in his next five-year plan. He's a wonderful advocate and we're happy to have him. Thank you for being here with us, Itulio. Yep, thanks for having me. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Getulio Gonzalez Militieri. As was said, I am the regional community organizer for Chiefs of Florida in the Tampa Bay area. And I'm leading the Clean Buses for Healthy Ninos campaign in Hillsborough County. So the mission of Chiefs for Florida is to build the power of low-income Latino and BIPOC and other underserved communities across Florida to achieve climate justice and equity, community health, and environmental protection. Chiefs for is committed to the objective of demanding accountability from any policymaker that's turned a blind eye to environmental racism and other disparities which exist within Latino and BIPOC communities. Our communities have endured environmental injustices for far too long and are now bearing the brunt of the climate crisis through environmental hazards, public health disparities, and climate gentrification. And it's without question that the current uh, housing crisis that we're experiencing here in Florida is largely driven by climate uh, gentrification. Um, part of CHISPA's educational mission includes sharing data on disparities in public health, among others. I personally find it egregious that Latinos are 30% more likely to visit hospitals for asthma and Latino children are 40% more likely to die from asthma and other respiratory condi uh, conditions than non-Latino whites. Uh, these disparities result in processes uh, utilizing the production and consumption of fossil fuels. So Chiefs of Florida stands in resolute opposition to new leases to offshore drilling. Accidents like the Deepwater Horizon oil spill has had inescapable consequences on our environment and our communities. According to a study conducted by Columbia University's National Center for Disaster Preparedness, more than a third of the children in Louisiana and Florida living less than 10 miles from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill were reported to experience physical or mental health symptoms. The parents of these children reported unexplained symptoms among their children, including bleeding ears, nosebleeds, and the early start of menstruation cycles among girls. This is only one of many instances where offshore drilling has directly resulted in a public health emergency. 
The leadership in our Latino and BIPOC communities, as well as our allies, can take forceful steps to protect our collective health from air and water pollution and from land contamination by demanding immediate accountability of corporate entities and policymakers at all levels of government and by pressuring them to rapidly advance the development of clean, affordable, safe, renewable energy sources. Similarly, investments from the public and private sector, sectors which renew frontline communities by make, making them more resilient and energy efficient have become an imperative to current, uh, curbing the climate crisis. While investments toward the electrification of automotives and innovation in public trans transit is on the upswing, the climate crisis must be addressed with greater urgency and a holistic approach must be taken. We need an all hands on deck approach in mobilizing the grassroots as engagement in the democratic process cannot be allowed to fail. The best way to forward equitable environmental policy is by electing public servants willing to prioritize the health of our communities and the well being of our environment. Chiefs of Florida stands vigilant on all these fronts. Hopefully the Biden administration takes all of this into account when rolling out the upcoming offshore leasing plan. Our communities are dying and they have the power to do something about it. That's what I have to say, thank you. Thank you so much, Natulio, um, for really speaking to those intersectional issues that are so important and a lot of times just unfortunately left out of the conversation. So I wholeheartedly thank you for your work and for the work of Chispa Florida and for being a part of this. Um, thanks so much. So our next guest um, was supposed to be Robin Miller, who's the uh, president and CEO of the Tampa Bay Beaches Chamber of Com Commerce. Unfortunately, she is ill today and can't join us, but I did want to just uh, give a plug quickly for Robin because the business, the business side of this you know, impacts the businesses on from offshore drilling is such an important piece to this. Uh, and in, in Florida, you know, our environment, healthy coasts, healthy oceans are inextricably linked um, to our coastal economy. Um, and Robin has really been a true leader in this in this space. Um, she's not only the president and CEO of the Tampa Bay Beaches Chamber of Commerce, but she's a founder of the Florida Gulf Coast Business Coalition which represents over 6,000 Florida businesses dedicated um, to protecting our coast from expanded offshore drilling. She's authored opinion pieces. She's lobbied on Capitol Hill and even testified as an expert witness at a US House uh, Natural Resources Committee hearing on offshore drilling. So we'll miss Robin's presence today. We wish her well and health. Um, and for those of you looking to, uh, if you represent a business or are interested in the Florida Gulf Coast Business Coalition, I encourage you to Google that organization um, and join their work. Okay. Well, moving on, I'm extremely honored to introduce our next panelist, Colette Pichon Battle. Colette is the founder and co executive director for the Gulf Centers. Uh, Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, which is a nonprofit public interest law firm that influenced realms from equitable disaster recovery to global migration, from community economic development to climate justice and energy democracy. Among her many activities, she serves on the board of the U.S. Climate Action Network and leads the Red, Black, and Green New Deal, the climate initiative the, for the uh, movement for Black Lives. So I'm ex extremely uh, happy to pass it on to Colette to talk about her work and the importance of that. Thank you so much, Hunter. And I wanna offer my thanks to all of you um, on the call today. This is an honor to be invited, especially into uh, what we call the Florida territories. Good news, I'm calling in from the Florida parishes of Louisiana. So I feel like I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I'm on the traditional lands of the Choctaw Nation and um, just wanna offer my respect and honor um, to that nation um, and the lands from which we do a lot of our work. Um, I'm calling in from Southeast Louisiana, so uh, the other side of the Gulf, 
And part of the reason why I get to be a uh, part of this conversation today is because um, we too are in full agreement with the work of Representative Castor and the work of many of you on the call today. We don't want to see any new leases in the Gulf. Um, and while I want to speak a little bit about our reality, I first want to say um, and offer my deep gratitude and thanks to Representative Castor for her great work, for her great advocacy. I think Representative Castor, you have proven to all of us in the Gulf what advocacy um, for what we love can do, uh, what it means to protect our home, what it means to fight for we know for what we know is right and clean and healthy, but also good for our economies and our communities. And I just want to say thank you for being the kind of leader that many of us can get behind. And I also want to say uh, to those of you listening in from Florida um, that the Western Gulf shares the fate of the Eastern Gulf. In fact, we have been bearing a lot of the brunt of the decisions made at the federal level around who can drill, where things can be drilled, and what happens when they explode and when they leak and when they harm the communities and the ecosystems around them. We know what it is to celebrate, to recognize um, all that we have in this ecosystem, and we know what it is to grieve over um, the impacts that uh, that we saw in the B in the aftermath of the BP uh, Deepwater Horizon explosion and the uh, subsequent oil drilling disaster that followed. We are interested in how we can work together, how we can stand together, how we can approach this moment of opportunity in deep unity across the Gulf. I want to mention that you know what what we can offer into this conversation, unfortunately, is um, a truthful tale of woe. Um, what it means to be in a place where extraction is allowed, uh, what it means to be in a place where destruction occurs all the time, and what it means to see the actual impact of offshore oil and gas drilling on our communities, which at a very uh, minimum equals inequality, inequity, and more discrimination. So we are not talking about an industry that will bring forth some unknown tale of wealth. We're talking about generations who have lived through oil and gas drilling in the Gulf, and we are no better for it. In fact, the wealth divide in South Louisiana with lots of oil and gas, even in Texas with lots of oil and gas, shows that this industry does bring wealth to some, but not to very many. And at what cost? We lose our ecosystems. For many of us in South Louisiana, South Texas, South Mississippi, we lose our culture and our traditions when we lose those ecosystems. And that means we're paying a bigger price than any uh, uh, economic impact that these industries might have on our state's GDP. It's important for you to understand that extraction occurs when they pull out this stuff from Mother Earth, and we've got to be more conscious about it. If nothing else, we've got to admit that we've taken enough. As Representative and others have mentioned, there are plenty of uh, leases that the oil and gas industry are already sitting on. I believe the Representative mentioned 11 million acres are already what they have in their, position, in their possession that they haven't begun to drill on yet. To get more, to tie the future into this dirty way of life is not what we want, and it's not what we deserve, and it's not what our communities are asking us to stand up for. They're asking us to stop this stuff from harming them, from harming us, and that's what we intend to do. And that extraction contributes to the climate crisis. This is the motivator. This is the engine of the climate crisis. Every single time we drill, every single time we pull oil or gas up, we are releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and we are accelerating these storms that brought people like me back home to fight for climate in the first place. This, we are not seeing something that we can't contribute a positive solution to. We are in control here. We just have to speak out and get behind our representatives who, who will speak out for our communities. Drilling oil or gas accelerates the climate crisis, period. We have to stop it and we have to stop it now. But destruction also occurs. As we heard um, from uh, the, the data that was presented earlier, our ecosystems are being impacted, our wildlife. And for those of you who live like those of us in South Louisiana, we eat out of these waters. Our tradition counts on us to have access to this. And so we have to protect it, not just because dolphins are cute and whales are special, but because our communities need to be able to eat out of these waters and we need to be able to depend on the bounty that is coming forth. And finally, I just want to mention and underscore the laborers of this industry 
often poor, often black, often uh, indigenous, they are not receiving the wealth that is being talked about. In fact, they're being exposed oftentimes to toxic working conditions without the benefit of unionized labor or protections for their own safety. We're not dealing with an industry that is bringing positivity to our region. We are dealing with an industry that is bringing destruction to our region and it's time for us to fight for it. This is the moment. This is the moment we can all move forward with on together, the east side of the Gulf and the west side of the Gulf. We need everyone to sign on petitions for no new leases in the Gulf. We want no more oil and gas drilling anywhere in that five-year plan. And if the Department of Interior or anybody else comes out saying, we've got to do more drilling, our answer collectively from the east to the west of this Gulf has to be no more sacrifice. We are not giving anything else to this dirty industry. And we're not just saying no. We wanna demand deep investments into renewable energy, but not just any renewable energy. We want renewable energy to be justly sourced. That means where these things are manufactured, where these big pieces are, the, the raw materials come from, they cannot accelerate crisis or tensions in other places around the globe. It's time for us to use our innovation to find ways to have justly sourced renewable energy invested at the levels that we see these oil and gas companies getting tax breaks and benefits from the federal government at right now. This is what we need to see. We're calling for no new leases. We're calling for bigger investment in justly sourced renewable energy, and we need your help to do it. We need to get behind Representative Castor and everyone else who has the courage to stand up for this region. We need to get behind these local organizations and everyone who has the courage to stand up and fight for their community. This climate crisis is our opportunity to lead and lead we shall and we'll lead with the front lines. Thank you. Colette, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for your presence here today and your passion and your work and commitment to this and we're really just honored to have you with us today. So thank you so much. Um, I also, Colette, I, I did want to provide a plug, the opportunity for you to plug about some really exciting things happening in Louisiana this weekend. Um, go ahead, give that a plug now because it's gonna be really amazing. Thank you so much, Hunter. Yes, I want to encourage everyone to um, check out uh, Gulf South for a Green New Deal.org. Um, check out climatejusticeenjoy.com. We are having a festival to celebrate, to visibilize the things we love about the Gulf, and to come together to decide how we're going to protect it. We've got delegations from Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and Puerto Rico coming in, along with delegations from across the nation, including. Alaska coming to stand with us as we stand at the seat of decision making in a place like Louisiana, but really signifying the decision making across the Gulf. This is going to be a festival. This is going to be climate justice and joy. This is music, food, community fun. This is family fun. And we want you to join us in Baton Rouge if you can. If you're not able to join us in person, we want you to at least amplify the messages coming out of the region, which is we choose now to make a change. We choose now to do things better. We choose now to invest in our future. And it is joy and love that is driving us. No longer fear, no longer anger, but the joy and the love of what we are and where we come from. And that's going to be enough for us to save all the things that we love. So just thank you, Hunter, for that opportunity. I'll ask folks to check out um, uh, Gulf South for Green New Deal org and just check out uh, what we're doing. We'd love to have you in Baton Rouge with us this weekend. Uh, also, just one last thing. I just got off the phone with Line 3 in Minnesota. They are also doing events June 4th. So it'll be from the top of the Mississippi to the bottom. And we ask for you to join us. Well, thank you for that. And I'll be joining you in joy in person. I plan on being there as well. And um, thank you so much again for, for joining us today. I know you're so busy putting that together. Okay, moving on. Um, our next panelist is absolutely no stranger to this issue uh, of protecting our coast from offshore drilling in Florida. Um, I'm proud to introduce Aliki Moncrief, um, the executive director of Florida Conservation Voters. FCV works to build political power to protect our environment, protect our democracy, and create a healthy and sustainable future for everyone. Uh, Aliki and I work together um, to build support for a constitutional amendment called Amendment 9 that uh, passed 
um, several years ago that banned offshore drilling in state waters. She's a wonderful advocate and, and leader on this issue in Florida, and we're happy to have her. Thank you for joining us, Aliki. Thanks so much, Hunter. Um, I feel really honored to be a part of this panel and I'm feeling really inspired. Uh, Colette, you, you've just um, infused this whole hour with so much amazing energy, joy and love. I'm really grateful uh, to you for doing that. Um, and I'm also grateful, you know, we vote and we elect our representatives so that when they go to DC or they go to Tallahassee or they go to wherever they go in their elected uh, capacity that they represent us. And we are incredibly fortunate to have uh, Representative Kathy Castor's leadership um, here in Florida and beyond. You know, she she speaks up and stands up not just for her constituents, but for, but for, for Floridians and, and for everyone living in the Gulf and really everyone on the planet when it comes to tackling the, the climate crisis. So really grateful um, to have her constant and steady, um, smart decision-making and advocacy um, as a voice for us in DC. Um, and you know, every time there has been a moment um, like this moment where we're talking about a five-year offshore leasing plan, um, which we'll get into in a, in a minute. Every time there's a moment um, to say no to offshore drilling, the people of Florida have an undeniable track record. Um, as Hunter mentioned, we worked together in 2018 um, on a constitutional amendment where nearly 70% of voters who cast, vote, who cast ballots that year in Florida voted to permanently ban drilling in state waters. Why does that happen? Well, in Florida, you know, we're a, we're a state that relies on three core industries, people moving here, tourism, agriculture. Uh, so with those three things, we all know that furthering our reliance on dirty fossil fuels actually causes harm on all of those fronts, not to mention, you know, um, the harm that it causes to our communities and, and our ecosystems. Um, so, you know, right now, the fate of this five-year or of offshore leasing plan may not actually be at the top of many people's minds. You know, Representative Castor mentioned um, earlier that you know, many families throughout the Gulf and throughout the country are, are struggling with high prices on a lot of things, high prices on consumer goods, high prices at the gas station, high housing costs. So people have their eyes on survival right now um, and they're looking for solutions. Unfortunately, what we see with the fossil fuel industry is the industry taking advantage of fear and uncertainty about the future. They're taking advantage of this to push for more drilling and they're fueling misinformation campaigns. When we know that expanded drilling, you know, adding to the, the library of new leases, that's not even going to provide a temporary fix, much less long-term solutions. Um, you know, I think the representative and others have said expanding drilling today isn't going to produce oil for years or even decades. But what we do know is that expanding those leases today would keep us locked into the very energy systems that are destroying our planet and destroying our communities. There's a better way. There is a cleaner future on the horizon that doesn't rely on fossil fuels. Um, and I know uh, Susan Glickman, who's coming up, is going to talk about some of those solutions. So I won't, I won't, uh, I, I, I won't give a spoiler alert. How about that? Or maybe I will give a spoiler alert. I always get those expressions wrong. Um, so the decision now pending with the Biden Harris administration is going to affect our children, their children, their children, and that's why this is a moment where we need leadership and courage and, and courage from the administration. Um, we need a transformative, clean energy future as Colette mentioned, one that is justly sourced uh, and expanding leases in the Gulf takes us in the absolute wrong uh, direction. Why are we even having these conversations? Well, I can guarantee that the fossil fuel industry has hundreds of lobbyists and other agents working overtime every day, delivering their talking points to our representatives. And that's why our representatives, the Biden administration, absolutely near need to hear from all of us, not just every two years or every four years when we vote, but now we need to stay civically engaged. We need to, and, and Hunter's gonna provide a link later, we need to start signing these petitions to voice our opposition to drilling. And when the time comes, we need to take advantage of public comment periods that are gonna open because it's not, it's not enough to vote and get the right people in office 
we also have to make sure that they're constantly hearing from us. And, and when it comes to uh, this five-year plan, they absolutely need to hear no new leases. So thanks again, Hunter. Thanks everyone uh, for, for including me on this conversation today. Thank you, Aliki, for joining us. As always, it's such a pleasure to see you and hear from you. Thank you so much. So we're moving on to our last panelist, um, Susan Glickman. Uh, Susan is an advocate for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and organizes uh, for the Florida Con Clinicians for Climate Action. She has worked for decades on clean energy policy uh, and organizing against exp the expansion of offshore drilling in Florida. You know, if someone were to come up to me in the street and say, who do I talk to about the history of offshore drilling in Florida? I'd say, I know you're, I know the person exactly that you need to talk to, and it would be Susan. We're really uh, amazingly lucky to work with her regularly um, in our coalition to uh, protect our coast from offshore drilling. And I'm really honored to introduce uh, my friend, uh, Susan Glickman. Hello, Hunter, thank you so much. Uh, part of me is super excited to be here. I'm always excited to be with people that I admire and respect. Um, then this was an exceptional group on the phone today. Um, but part of me just says, I can't believe we're still having to have this conversation, right? So both uh, Hunter and Aliki and others have alluded uh, to an initiative that was passed in 2018, and that was to put in Florida's constitution, um, a, a, a ban on drilling in state waters that is 10 miles to the shore. And one of the reasons that I emphasize that because there's a lot of what we all term politics um, involved in that. Um, and the efforts to drill or to pass legislation to allow us to drill in near shore waters is a little bit of a uh, pressure point to open up drilling in the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. So there's a bit of a political tactic. So the head of the American Petroleum Institute was in little Tallahassee, Florida state capital, nosing around with Florida lawmakers and policymakers about ending this near shore ban on drilling that was just added to the state constitution. So it's just important to understand that even though, as Congresswoman Castor said, and I'm I'm the president of the Kathy Castor fan club here, so uh, anyway, I won't spend too much time on that. But but Congresswoman Castor, you are you are just a breath of fresh air to everyone involved in this movement, and you have done so much over a number of years. So that said. But here we are. It's hard to believe in 2009, the Florida House of Representatives voted to, to lift the nearshore ban. And that's why we had to go to the state constitution. And even though they have all of those leases, they're not satisfied with that. They want to come back for more and continue to addict us. So I just uh, wanted to put a fine point that this is a concern right now. Because I think a lot of people believe it's sort of off the table. It's also been talked about with the high gas prices, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and what that is doing uh, to prices for people. And I do understand um, how many people are suffering with just making basic decisions to cover their needs. But a big part of what we're talking about here today is saving money. And whether we're saving money in our region or in our community, or we're saving money as individuals, that's what the electrification of transportation offers us. So if you're an individual person, Consumer Reports says that over the life cycle of an electric vehicle, you're going to save between six and $10,000 in ownership costs. You're saving $4,700 on fuel costs alone. So those are the kind of, of savings that individuals can, can look forward to if we have favorable policies and we move to electrify transportation and in a way, in particular, in an equitable uh, way. And I'll, I'll mention some of those things. Uh, but even if we're looking sort of more globally in terms of saving dollars, in the Southeast region, we have about $47 billion in what we call retained fuel dollars. 
So once you bring in fuel from elsewhere, right, you're sending energy dollars out here at home. We do this in the electric sector where we send about $65 billion a year. And it's very similar. The Southeast um, loses about $47 billion. So that's money that is on the table for local communities when we move to clean energy solutions. You're keeping those energy dollars right here. And it's part of how we start to get a more equitable transition, right? So you're going to save just money on fuel savings and so forth, but you're also going to improve public health. And that's what the electrification of transportation does. Hunter mentioned that I work with Florida clinicians for climate action. There are 18 clinician uh, affiliates around the country, and people are starting to understand more and more about the public health implications of climate change. So there's a, um, whether or not we call it a savings um, or we stop spending all this money on public health. Um, but it's, um, it's really a huge problem. And of course, um, the American Lung Association is one of our favorite resources on, on public health just released their report and the potential for public health savings. And as any member of Congress would tell you, we spend an enormous amount of money um, on public health. So four out of 10 Americans live in a community where the air is unhealthy and people of color are 3.6 times more likely to live in those unhealthy communities. So think about all the savings that we're gonna get from there. Or so ago, it was transportation emissions that overcame the electric sector. So what do we do? Here's the good news. And as someone um, who, like others on the phone, have been doing this for quite some time, we get to talk about electric transportation, electric vehicles in a way that we really couldn't have, um, you know, even three years ago, right? You would have to be living under a rock and not ever watching things like the Super Bowl uh, to know that there are about a hundred electric vehicle models that are coming out now. I just saw um, an ad for a, a garbage truck um, that's coming out. So we're starting to have, there's more electric buses and more availability. And this is how we are going to um, reduce this addiction. We're gonna move quickly, particularly with things like fleet transitions. And, and I sort of put that in my kind of top 10. It's for people, what can you do? Climate change is interesting because it's something where the individual can take action. So you can make your home more efficient and you can also get solar and you can also drive an electric vehicle. But really uh, to get at the scale that we need to avoid the worst implications of the climate crisis, we need policy and we need uh, really globally. Um, so we need plans for all local governments. We need to look at the transitioning of fleets. We need charging infrastructure. That's another area where equity plays a role because 80% of charging happens at home. So if we don't put charging infrastructure into multifamily uh, units now, when they're being built, it can cost as much as 10 times more uh, after the fact. So we've got to get out in front and we need to look at funding and financing. There's no reason in the world that we can't finance even used electric vehicles for lower income people. Most people don't drive more than 40 uh, miles in a day and you don't have all those maintenance costs. So there is an opportunity. I mean, it, we're gonna have to do the right thing and put the right plans in place, uh, but this is something that can help people's public health. It can save so much money for our governments. Um, I saw a quote from a transportation manager in Greenville, South Carolina, said he can save $300,000 over the life cycle of an electric a bus. So that's pretty impressive. And we can do this thing. And we have this technology available right now. And, um, and that's what we need to do. Uh, because the entire Gulf of Mexico was hurt. University of South Florida marine scientists are still finding oil in the fish that we're eating. And you know that hurts old, it hurts young, in particular people who, who subsist on, on, on fish from the Gulf, but really everybody. So we can do better. So I'm, I'm thrilled there is no shortage of solutions. We have it, we can do this thing, but we need to get moving now because 
you know, uh, the oceans are warming, the storms are getting, uh, uh, you know, more intense. And one thing we can do is to electrify our transportation. We can avoid the need uh, to drill and drilling is just dirty business. So with that, I'll just turn it back over to Hunter and we can get into some conversation. Thank you, Susan. Yes, we do. Um, we do need to get moving. I totally agree with that. Um, and today we've shared a couple petition links and we'll continue to do that towards the end of our program. Um, you know, so what we do know is at the end of June, the Biden administration will be releasing their next five year plan and we'll have 90 days to, to comment on that plan. And that is our moment. That is our moment to um, let them know exactly what we want. And uh, we want clean, renewable energy and we want no new leases. And that's our opportunity. So if you use this petition link that we have, that will go to the federal register um, and, uh, and we'll be engaging. Once that plan comes out, we'll be engaging with our memberships. I, I ask that y'all follow these organizations and support them that are our co-partners co on this event. Um, so I, I just wanted to give a thanks. I wanted to thank uh, Representative Castor for being with us today um, and for, for speaking in for her work on Capitol Hill. And I also want to thank our coalition partners and our allies today, the Gulf Center, uh, Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, Environment Florida, Florida Conservation Voters, Chiefspa Florida, Southern, Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, Healthy Gulf, and Rethink Energy. Um, and as we wrap up today, um, it's just good to kind of center. We, we know that offshore drilling is fueling our ever worsening climate crisis. And it's threatening the lives and livelihoods of millions of Americans who rely on a clean, healthy ocean. So case in point, the oil spill off the coast of California last year, case in point, the BP disaster, um, all these countless spills that occur each year that Sarah mentioned, um, these events are a tragic confirmation of what we know far too well, um, which is offshore drilling is dirty and dangerous. And when they drill, they spill. And there is no operator that can guarantee that there won't be another disaster. So um, now's our chance to fight to permanently protect our oceans and coasts from new, dirty, and dangerous offshore drilling once and for all. As I mentioned, President Biden and his administration are set to release their five-year offshore drilling plan. And it's critical that we come together, support each other, and let them know that it's time to protect all of our coasts and issue no new leasing and act on climate. Uh, the QR code here, you can take action right now by using that or by using the link in the chat. Um, again, just one more plug. Um, if you wanna follow the Gulf Gathering for Climate Justice and Joy, please check that out. That's in the chat as well. Um, and today we're probably a little bit too close to the end to really open it up for questions, but I wanna thank everyone for joining um, and for contributing to this conversation. Um, and. Uh, Hope you all are well, stay safe and enjoy your day.